Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Well Said. I'm excited for our guest today, Jay Green. Jay is a senior research fellow in the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Now, Jay, you've written a lot on things regarding concerns for the future of higher education, obviously, but one thing in particular that you've covered um, is this increasing blow and discrimination that is coming out of the university's diversity, equity, and inclusion departments and initiatives. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, first of all, before we get started on the discussion. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, on a past episode, I had discussed with a guest, Ariel Davidson, that um, we kind of explored the reasons behind a lot of the anti-Semitic thinking that seems to be on the rise on college campuses. But we were also kind of talking a lot about why campuses are these breeding grounds for anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, and many times, oftentimes, anti-Semitic movements, like the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, or BDS as it goes by, against Israel. Uh, so your recent report looks at this kind of anti-Semitic sentiments on campuses as something that's much more insidious, actually, than kind of what we talked about in previous episodes. So by looking at personal statements that the DEI staff regularly make online, and your, your report shines a light on these kind of like real thought processes, right, that are of these supposed diversity and inclusion experts. So I would like to start off with you just kind of telling us why, um, kind of what made you want to do this research, uh, what initiated this thinking on your end? Sure. So in a prior study, um, we documented how many DEI staff there are at 65 universities, the universities that are members of the Power Five athletic conferences. And uh, we found that the average school had 45 DEI staff. Now that's not professors in gender or ethnic studies. It's not Title IX compliance people. These are people whose sole responsibility it is to promote the political and social agenda of DEI. And uh, so once we put that study together, we had a list of 3000 names at these 65 universities. And we thought, well, we, we, we think that these offices are doing a lot to promote anti-Semitism on campus. And we wanted to be able to see if we could document that in a systematic way. So what we did is we searched for the Twitter accounts of those 3000 people. Now, as it turns out, we were only able to find about 700 uh, accounts. Um, a lot of people don't have Twitter accounts or they have them uh, not under their name uh, or we simply were unable to find them. But we were, were able to find 700 uh, accounts of DEI staff. And then we did a systematic search of their accounts for all references to Israel and all references to Palestinians and all references to China, okay? And we, we wanted to see what they had to say about Israel because we were interested in that as a proxy for what they have to say about Jews. Mm -hmm. And we were interested in China as a comparison. So if their concerns about Israel were simply motivated by a concern about human rights, then we would expect them also to have concerns about Chinese human rights as well. Right. Um, and so that's why we made this, this comparison to, to China. Um, and when we did that, we found that two things. One is that, that DEI staff are relatively obsessed with Israel compared to China. They tweet about Israel more than three times as much as they tweet about China. Hmm. Um, even though Israel is a small country, um, even though there were a lot of reasons for them to be talking about China, given that there was a pandemic that originated there, you, given that there's all sorts of conflict and strife with China, uh, human rights concerns with China. There were lots of reasons for them to be talking about China, but they talk about China very little relative to how much they talk about Israel. So they're, they're relatively obsessed with Israel and they're almost universally critical. 96% of their communications online about Israel were critical, um, while 62% of their communications about China were favorable. So they have relatively favorable things to say about China and overwhelmingly critical things to say about Israel. And it's not just that, they're, that they had critical things to say, but they used hyperbolic anti-Semitic language in their criticisms. So lots of references to Nazis, Holocaust, um, uh, uh, and child murder accusations, um, 
uh, very hyperbolic language. Um, right. To sow that and, kind of like hatred and disgust with the with the country. Right. It's they, not just that they had the kind of measured criticism or concern right. about human rights. They had hyperbolic criticism with intemperate language. And mind you, these are people who have a professional responsibility to help people come together and get along on college campuses, right? That's supposedly their job, right? So it's as if you, um, you know, searched the accounts of doctors and, and found that they, you know, went on and on about how awesome it was to mainline heroin, right? That would be like a very shocking thing that would be inconsistent right. with their normal responsibilities as a physician uh, to, to have them say online, well, these are people who are supposed to be helping people get along and 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 understand each other better um uh and yet uh, they have this obsession with criticizing israel with intemperate language um and what the, i think that reveals is that their main motivation is not actually to promote diversity and inclusion but that their main goal is to advance a a a leftist agenda that includes hating israel and that's really what they're just political activists on campus being paid with our tuition and tax dollars. Why is hating Israel like, let's just dive into that a little bit. Why is that part of the left's agenda? Why, why is that even something that they care so much about? Right. So so um, I, the reasons for it, I think, are, are articulated in a, a really great Ruth Weiss piece that she had in National Affairs in which she said that that anti-Semitism is really has to be understood as a political hmm. movement. That is, it's something that has political advantages for people. They get something out of it. Um, and so it shouldn't be seen as something that is irrational um, or psychologically disturbed, although it may have those characteristics, um, but that people rationally choose it because it gets them advantages. And along those lines, in a, in a study that, um, that Albert Chang, <clears throat> Ian Kingsbury and I did, we actually found that the higher educated people are, the more anti-Semitic they are, hmm. which suggests again that, that anti-Semitism is not driven by ignorance. Hmm. It's not that they don't know about Jews or don't understand the Holocaust. Uh, they know, um, they just don't care. Um, and they don't care because they get benefits out of sticking it to Jews. And wow. so, so why is it that this is a thing on campus? Why is this part of a leftist political coalition? Because as Ruth Weiss says, it allows unlike groups to come together in a coalition. So how do fundamentalist Muslims and secular progressives come together into an alliance, hmm. right? How does, yeah. how does, Elon Omar and Bernie Sanders come into an alliance, right? They they don't actually share um, some basic beliefs like about religion, um, uh, but what they can share is hatred of Jews, and that allows them to come together and achieve other common objectives that they may possess, and so it, it helps form a coalition of unlike groups. Um, now, I'm That's sure the right has its own version of this, uh, hopefully not, not filled with hatred. Um, but, you know, all political coalitions involve right. people who have some differences who then have overarching reasons to come together. And yeah. they have to have certain common things that help glue them together. And unfortunately, it's increasingly becoming the case that progressives have Jew hatred as one of the things that helps bring them together. That's that's very fascinating. I would say on the right, it's probably at least one of the things is it's mar the market economy and capitalism is kind of like it brings a lot of factions within the right together, you know, like cut taxes. Yay, we all agree on that. Right. So right. things things like that. Um, but yeah, that's so fascinating because with this rise of this, the, the talking about identity politics and critical race theory and like we mentioned, DEI, all these different initiatives and all these different conversations where there's this huge push about like white supremacy. Right. Um, you mentioned in the report, or at least you um, you uh, you kind of uh, uh, reference it at least in one of your comments in the report, um, David Badiel's "Jews Don't Count" book, and I think that's a really good a really good um, thing to bring up here because I remember when we first started talking about 
white supremacy and CRT and 1619, just like when it started to really take off in the, in the social context um, only a handful of years ago, it seemed that Jews were actually considered kind of like the ultimate, the way that they would talk about the Jewish population, there's these like ultimate white supremacists in, in such a way they they put them at the top. I saw this image of like a pyramid where they like listed out all of the different, um, the hierarchy of white supremacy and the Jewish population was like towards the top, if not at the very top. And so I found that really fascinating because I was like, oh, I kind of would have assumed that that movement would have tried, would have recognized not only the history of Jews and discrimination against the Jewish populations, but also would have like kind of tried to embrace that as like, hey, you're a minority too, and you should be on our side with all the minority talk. Um, but instead of looping them to that diversity, they're actually putting them off into the other category of the enemy, right? Yeah, I mean, it's true that um, that groups shift in how they're thought of as oppressed or advantaged, but. Uh, the truth is that these alliances don't come together because of an objective assessment of who's oppressed more, right? They're simply convenient alliances for common political purposes. And so there's no sense for Jews to compete in the oppression Olympics. There's no sense in trying to argue that Jews really deserve to be in the oppressed group rather than in the advantage group. Um, uh, because that's not the calculation that's being used for making these alliances. And it's not really what's fueling anti-Semitism. Right. So it's not actually the, I mean, th there's another book out there that everyone loves dead Jews. Um, and, and while I think that's true, um, uh, uh, it, you know, we actually wouldn't be better off if, if, if we were dying off. Um, mm -hmm. That would not actually help us uh, in any way um, not only because we'd be dying, but also because it's not really the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that people have reasons to form coalitions for their political purposes. And part of the glue of that coal coalition is that they all get to hate Jews together. Uh, and they could do it for their own separate reasons. Um, now, the truth is, and I think there's another important point to emphasize, this is not the dominant worldview in academia. Hmm. Higher education is not anti-Semitic because right. it is the overwhelming perspective of students and faculty. It's not. Hmm. The most faculty and students are kind of center left, right? They're, they're not radicals. They're not, they're not Bernie Sanders devotees or Ilan Omar devotees. That, that's a minority group of both students and faculty. Um, most are, are fairly centrist. But what campus has done is that it's elevated the status, power, and voice of the extremists so that they have far more control over higher ed institutions than they should, uh, than their num true numbers would represent. And one of the main vehicles they have for doing that is DEI. DEI is the organizational advantage they have on campus that employs their adherents to, to articulate and enforce their orthodoxy mm -hmm. on a bunch of other people on campus who don't like it, right? So right. Most, most faculty don't wanna be censored. Most students don't wanna be censored. They, right. So, and the reason why I emphasize this is that the right shouldn't lose hope about academia. It's not a lost cause. It's not that academia is just inherently a left-wing thing and captured by crazies. It, it is a center left thing, that's true, but we can work with that and make it sensible if we can drive out radicals from gaining control over these institutions. And we can do that. And we can do that by, by defunding DEI, right? Mm -hmm. Getting state legislatures to cut that funding. Get, I mean, state universities receive money from taxpayers. State legislators right. can tell universities that they don't think this is an appropriate thing for universities to be doing with tax dollars. Um, and we can also be empowering alumni and trustees to exercise influence in private institutions to do the same. Right. Um, so I, I think there's a reason to fight for yeah. academia. It's not a lost cause, and we could drive out radicals and Jew haters if we just decide to stand up to them and not let them bully us uh, and use their organizational advantages of DEI to, to drive us out, right? We shouldn't be driven right. out. Right, and 
So I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you think it would be effective then? Because the way that the, the left has kind of gone about this in order to drive out conservative faculty members is they will identify them, call them out, accuse them of various um, racist and bigoted things, oftentimes try to tack on some sort of harass a sexual harassment claim, um, and then they'll get their tenure removed and get them kicked out. Um, but I've seen oftentimes on the left, usually when there's a professor, for example, I went to Georgetown uh, for grad school, and one of the professors, Christine Fair, she tweeted that um, conservative white men should be essentially killed and then their bodies should be hung up and castrated and everyone should dance around and, and you know, enjoy that. And I thought to myself, well, that would make probably if she had any white conservative men in her classroom, um, that would probably make them pretty uncomfortable um, and, you know, <laughs> make them feel as if they're being they could be discriminated against in her class or at least their viewpoints could be. Um, so. I guess the question is like she was she ended up being reinstated she's now still a full-time tenured professor and then we saw what happened with Ela Shapiro with Georgetown right. complete opposite right. and his tweet wasn't even near as bad as what she tweeted so right. there's like there's clearly a difference here but the, the I think the biggest um overlap with all of these scenarios is that it's the identifying of names and calling them out, making their tweets public, because the thing with Christine Fair is it didn't really go public because it wasn't really covered by the media. It was buried by the university um, and because she had a lot of support by the students. So there's all of these kind of, like, I'm curious. So what are your thoughts then on what these, especially the very anti-Semitic comments that are being made by these DEI staff about calling them out, identifying them. You mentioned taxpayers would be very interested in defunding things like this if they knew what was going on. Um, so your report is super informative, but I noticed it doesn't mention any names. It doesn't mention the universities. Is that something that you think would be helpful to the, to the movement in order to get some of these ex more extremist folks out of the offices? Sure, so we did not actually, we intentionally avoided identifying any of the individuals um, because we don't want to, feed into a cancel culture. Um, what we'd actually prefer is a university culture where there is a free exchange of ideas, uh, including hateful ideas. Um, you know, that uh, uh, what, what is bothersome is the asymmetry, as you point out, how differently Fair and Shapiro were treated at Georgetown. That's the problem. But yeah. tolerating both is not a problem, I think. I, I, it's not that I want Fair fired. Mm -hmm. um, and Shapiro fired too. I want neither fired. Um, and I think the way we can get there is by balancing the incentives that administrators face. So we should understand that university administrators are not principled people with deep commitments to academic norms. They don't. Th there was once upon a time academics at universities were accomplished scholars who basically took a turn helping run a, a university, especially when they became a little too senior to be producing as much new scholarship, right? Then they would just take a turn helping run the place. And it was essentially run as a big collective, right? Faculty literally governed. Um, now faculty do not govern. And administrators are full-time professionals. That's a whole career path. Right? Yeah. They're not accomplished scholars. Yeah. For the most part, they're shockingly unimpressive. Uh, they're, they're the losers of academia who, who tend not to produce really good scholarship, but instead go into the power route, right? where they go to control things and people. Um, and all they care about is ambition, rising up in this hierarchy of having higher status, power, and pay. Uh, in the university world, either at their institution or some other one. So if we think of them as these unprincipled, ambitious people. And some of the highest paid too on the campus. Yeah, right? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> no, and, they, and they have inordinate control over what happens, right? Yeah. So the, right, they, it used to be faculty were kind of governing universities as a collective. Now faculty are just staff who mm. work for unaccomplished, power hungry administrators. OK, yeah. mm -hmm. that's what it looks like now. But that's something we can work with, because what it means is that that these administrators are responsive to pressure. They don't care. They're not they, they are not protecting fair because they believe her. Mm -hmm. They're not asymmetrical because they really have a deep commitment to the left. They don't care. They're not ideologically driven. They're personally driven. OK, and what that means is right now they're only getting pressure from the left. 
And they only get pressure from the left because there's this very well-organized minority of students and faculty, largely organized by the DEI staff, who, uh, who basically terrorize the administrators. They threaten them that they're gonna have protests and embarrassing headlines if they don't give in to the demands of the DEI rabble-rousers, okay? And um, what we want is for, for these administrators to have an, a balanced fare on the right. They should be afraid that state legislators are gonna call them down for hearings and demand that they answer questions about why they treat fair and Shapiro differently, mm -hmm. right? And right. threaten to cut off their funding and threaten to eliminate their position, right? So essentially, um, you know, think of it like like how what Chris, Chris Rufo did did to Disney. Yeah. Disney doesn't actually care about yeah. uh, pride. They don't have a deep ideological commitment. They really like money. That's mostly what they like. Okay, and. They were just caving in on the pride stuff because that's where all the pressure was coming from. And Rufo said, well, what if we apply pressure on the other side? What if DeSantis comes along and says, I'm gonna take away your tax advantages. Um, then that wakes up the Disney executives who don't really care and just want money. And it gets them to balance out those incentives and, and behave in a way that's actually more responsible for their shareholders yeah. and for the general public. The same could be true of universities, right? Yeah. They're, they're also just interested in power status money. We could apply pressure to them on the right to balance out the pressure on the left so that they don't behave in a discriminatory way only against the left. I think that's that's the way forward here. And I think it's it's totally doable. And so just to clarify real quickly, so when you say administrators, you're talking about kind of like the university presidents and deans versus right. kind of like what we would sometimes call administrators at like the DEI department heads, right? So those are, I guess, more faculty then. Those would kind of be like a different, those are the more ideologically driven tier. So the DEI staff are administrators, but they're low yeah. level administrators. Right. So the, there is a vice chancellor or something like that for DEI. That person is an administrator. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that person report, reports to the chancellor or to a provost um, right. or a dean. And all those people, I mean, the, the one who is the DEI person in each of those units um, is an administrator, but there are a lot of other administrators too who may not have any commitment to the DEI issue at all in any deep way, um, but do care about power status and money. And right. if, they, if they come to believe that they're gonna be embarrassed by being called down to testify and answer questions about why certain things are happening on campus, and if they have their funding put in jeopardy, and if they have embarrassing news stories from the right instead of from the left, uh, so that it might make it harder for them to get a job at the next university, they'll crack down on, on the, the left radicals and, and, and make the, the campus a more balanced place um, if they also have pressure, organized pressure from the right as, as they currently do from the left. And that organized pressure really needs to come from, from state legislators, right? There are all these yeah. Yeah, red certainly. states mm -hmm. where, where the only thing that universities have to fend off those red legislators is football. So that's um, true. They are there are a lot of times state legislators are scared to go after universities because right. there's so much money there. And most of the money is attached to sports, sports programs. And it's well, right. I mean, the universities offer skybox tickets to the yeah. legislators. Legislators like this. It's fun. They also like it because it's great networking for them. They get to yeah. meet all yeah. the powerful people at in the skybox at the football game. Um, and you know, if there's if there's one thing that universities are really really effective at, it's not it's not creating educated people, but they're really good at creating uh, what in Hebrew is called ruach. That is, they create spirit. Um, it's it's the modern equivalent of 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 patriotism, mm. right? We we don't have patriotism really anymore, but we do have an attachment to the the um, athletic program of our state university. Right, <laughs> many red states. Um, yeah. and, That's and this is a good true. thing, yeah. right? Patriotism yeah. is a good thing. And cause it binds us in a healthy mm -hmm. way, 
it makes us and our neighbors feel connected to each other in a common cause. Um, so here in Arkansas, we can all be Razorbacks. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a good thing. Um, it'd be nice if we could also be Americans, um, you know. But it, but I'll take I'll take any kind of of healthy patriotism we can get. Um, and so universities are really good at this, and it's part of though of how they fend off state state legislators because hmm. state legislators are a little afraid of going after the state university because everyone loves the Razorbacks. Right, right. right. They but don't want to be the enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the now I think just like people love Disney and there's a certain amount of latitude they get for yeah. doing some crazy stuff before people get angry with them and threaten to boycott them and take away their tax breaks. Similarly, I think universities are reaching the line where they're going to wear out this this state patriotism they have for for the for the local team. Yeah. Um, and and that's when that happens, state legislatures are going to start holding hearings. So when provosts, deans, chancellors are dragged down to state legislatures to answer questions, those state legislators are going to ask uh, about why they're doing uh, various crazy things on campus, why they're allowing those crazy things to occur, why they're using taxpayer and tuition dollars for those purposes. And I think that those uh, university administrators will be eager to avoid that embarrassment, eager to avoid the hassle and the potential financial loss, um, and they'll get their house in order. And, mm -hmm. and when that happens, I think we'll have a return to kind of more professional and scholarly behavior on campus. Now, you know, that's not going to be an easy fight and it's not going to be overnight, but I, I see a path for how it is that we can recapture universities as decent, sensible places as they once were. Um, they're never gonna become you know, places that are perfectly aligned with our value preferences, but that's okay. Um, they just have to be places that allow us uh, to exist uh, and thrive and make our case to persuade people that, that our views are, are the correct ones. Right, right. And, and obviously, like for like the seeking of truth, right, and have, being willing to even try to, to have that conversation of what what truth is. Right. That's the that's the, been the biggest issue lately is not even being able to have the discussions. Um, that's right. Yeah. And so so back on your report, because you mentioned patriotism in one of your comments. Um, and I, I, I noticed that some of the things that and I think there might be conflation just with understanding what anti-Semitism is, with especially with a lot of these administrators and faculty members who are tweeting these things or, or posting things on social media, they might genuinely believe they aren't being anti-Semitic or they might not think that they are, but they're, they're promulgating these ideas and these sentiments regardless, right? So by putting it on social media. Now that's obviously giving them a very big benefit of doubt, um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on just, I feel, I feel like a lot of times we do cloak or not we, but like universities especially, but just the general public tends to cloak anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism or anti-Israel. And we talked about part of the reason why that might be on the political side for to get, um, as political drivers to get different factions to work together on the left. Um, but how does the, how do we fix this with the public understanding of what anti-Semitism is? Because I know there are right. formal definitions out there, but they're not yeah. being spread around and they're not really being accepted by universities or other folks either. Well, they are being spread around okay. and, and some states are actually adopting them as, as their own official definitions of anti-Semitism for the purposes of local laws and regulations. And um, is, this the, is this the IRA? The, um, is the IRA definition, okay. which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, I think is, I, I'm horrible at acronyms, yeah. but I think that's what it's saying. It's always called the IRA definition. Right. Um, and it's a very well-crafted definition that, that, cap, that prevents this evasion you're describing, where mm. people have figured out if they just use the slightly uh, disguised code of mm. saying Zionist instead of Jew, Right. Um, that you can get away with you know, all the Jew hatred you like. Um, you just just say, well, I got nothing against Jews. It's just Zionists I don't like. Right. Um, uh, it's, you know, all of their money grubbing, uh, you know, use all the anti-Semitic tropes, but you just say Zionist. Uh, right. exactly. and, and that really does not get you out of be, being clearly identified as an anti-Semite. And the IRA definition prevents that by including... Um, disproportionate and intemperate 
uh, criticism of Israel uh, in its definition of anti-Semitism. And, and in fact, it's, it's kind of the IRA definition that inspired um, how we compared criticism of Israel and China in our study ah. is that we, we understood the criticism of Israel as, as a code on campus for criticism of Jews. Um, and, and the intemperate language that we observed clearly met all the, the IRA definition criteria for, for having those statements be considered anti-Semitic. Um, and so, so yes, I think states could continue to expand use of the IRA definition for legal purposes, mm -hmm. um, and and that would help prevent this 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 uh, evasion. Now, I think you know, as you were implying earlier, this evasion does not work with respect to hatred for other groups, right? So yeah. you can't um, if you talk about welfare queens, everyone understands that there's a racial code in talking about welfare queens. Um, and so you can't go around on campus saying, "Look, I've got no problem with blacks. It's just welfare queens, I, I you know, who, who I don't like." Um, uh, people understand what that what that means. Um, now this gets into a tricky business because not all codes act, actually are code. Some codes are just referring to concerns about welfare, and right. some people have legitimate concerns with Israel, and everyone's allowed to have those concerns and to express them. Um, and we want universities to be open places where people can have these different views and exchange them in a, in a scholarly temperate way so that we can, uh, as you noted, um, get closer to the truth, uh, through, uh, disputation and competing ideas. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's an excellent point in, in saying that, you know, it's, it's, there are obviously these kind of like coded ways, but uh, that you can talk about race without being racist, right? Or like without being anti Semitic. But I think, you know, especially context is important. And that's what the IRA definition kind of lays out, which is like within these contexts, no, we know exactly what you're talking about. And it's no secret to us anymore. So I'm happy to hear that state legislators are adopting this. But I'm curious, like, what is the response? What is, are, like, how is the reception to the IRA definition, especially on university? Well, there's campuses? a counter movement. Uh, I understand, I think it's the Jerusalem definition. Uh, I think this is, you know, an attempt to make it not seem like the front anti it might, anti -Semitic, might yeah. be, um, uh, where, where it's more narrowly tailored and would not include the, this criticism of it did, the disproportionate and intemperate criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. And uh, so there's a counter movement to try to get that adopted by academic organizations, universities, and states instead. Um, and look, this is going to play out in the, in the political arena. Um, uh, but I think that um, the American people as a whole are not anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. They're not. Uh, in right. fact, if anything, they're philo-Semitic. Um, Jews yeah. have done very well in the United States, been very well treated overall, um, and, um, and have much to be grateful for um, right. uh, to the United States and, and are. Um, and, and so I think that, that, um, that in a, a open political battle between competing definitions of anti-Semitism, the IRA definition is likely to prevail because it's it's more in line with where most people are. Uh, most people understand that when, uh, you know, uh, progressives engage in intemperate criticism and disproportionate criticism of Israel, that they're really talking about Jews. And everyone understands this. And, and so I think that will prevail politically. Um, uh, on this. And, and so again, I'm, I'm optimistic hmm. that you know things look bad now on campus, but they're not going to be like this forever. This tide will have to turn if universities wish to continue receiving the public and private support that they currently receive. Uh, they're going to have to moderate, and I, I think they will. Yeah, I mean, I think that my biggest concern with IRA is, well, not that I have a concern with the definition. I'm worried that you're even going to get free speech you know, proponents who are going to, because we've seen, for example, organizations like the Foundation for Individual Rights of 
and now which is now expression instead of education they just changed their name this week um mm -hmm. to to kind of broaden their scope and you know we've done work with them on free speech issues and concerns on college campuses and they've been advocates for a long time. Greg Lukanoff, you know, wrote the the coddling of the American mind. So they, they've they've kind of been involved with this issue for a long time. But my concern was when they actually came out against the IRA definition, they 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 said that it would tamp down on free speech. And I mean, I don't really see the way that the way that IRA actually lays it out. One, it, it specifies these are non legally binding terms. Um, and right. two, it also which means it's not they're not attempting to violate the First Amendment in any way or, or undermine the Constitution. Um, right. But even so, it, it does specify that uh, it does specify that it's <laughs> it, it's pretty clear, like what exactly you're saying. It, you know, I'll read it real quickly. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews, rhetorical and physical. And I think that's where fire has some of their problem. But manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. If this definition replaced the word Jews with like uh, minority, other minorities like blacks or Asians or whatnot, it would be perfectly acceptable. And right. and so this is something that I'm not really sure how, how how like maybe you maybe you know more about this side of kind of the the position of the free speech concerns. I'm not super familiar with it, but I don't really see how it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it feels a little double standard ish to me as well, um, which is uh, to be overly concerned about. Um, how um, the IRA definition um, might uh, uh, chill free speech in, in a way that people have no similar concerns about um, mm -hmm. other kinds of, of, of uh, defini definitions and, and even legal protections uh, that are in place for other communities, um, including racial identities and sexual preference identities. Right. Um, I mean, if we can have laws about uh, about um, uh, non-discrimination uh, uh, on the basis of race or sexual identity, then I don't see why we can't, Jew Jews can be included in the race ethnicity category. Um, well, certainly, yes. And, and excluding them itself would, would seem to be anti-Semitic. Um, <laughs> now, my preference is, I, th I think, in, in line with yours, which is that these definitions uh, just help us know who's who. So we can know who the Jew haters are and we can call them Jew haters uh, without right. without having to work too hard to keep defending and justify that over and over. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that we uh, excommunicate them from, from academia. It just means we know who they are and we right. call them what they are. Um, but they're still uh, you know, allowed to be there and express themselves in the same way that people are allowed to be on camp campus and express themselves about any other group. Now, if, if there are pro... If, if there are lines that we've drawn for what constitutes harassment that protect other groups, those lines should be the same lines for Jews. Now, where exactly those lines are drawn, I'm not smart enough to know. I don't, I, I don't know how to do that. But, but all that I want is, is for these standards to be equally applied across groups. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I can certainly agree with that. I think most of our listeners would agree with that too. It's like, you know, we're talking about the DEI departments, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion, whatever that may mean to the people working in those departments. To us, it means, you know, the same thing that it, the this country's always kind of stood for, which is that's equality, you know, the equal equal rights and protections under, under the law um, for all. So well, that's, and that's, that's, I mean, look, this is the, the, the deep clash here hmm. is between a, a, a longstanding American value of equal treatment under the law. Now, right. mind you, we've we've fallen short of this ideal um, yeah. many times in our history, and 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 just because we've fallen short doesn't mean that it's not our ideal, and we shouldn't strive to make it more of a reality. But but the longstanding American value is equal treatment under the law. However, the DEI worldview is a fundamentally different value yeah. that actually draws its roots from a, a watered down Marxism. Which is that the world is actually divided into the oppressed and the oppressor, mm -hmm. uh, the advantaged or privileged and the disadvantaged, and um, and that these different groups, your your membership of these different categories, justifies differential treatment. The privileged deserve to have their privilege taken away, and the disadvantaged deserve reparation for the the suffering they, they've endured, and. Once you shift from the kind of longstanding American value of equal treatment towards this 
DEI worldview um, of, of differential treatment by, by, group, uh, by group classification, right. um, then you, you, you really change what it is that, that happens in this country. Now, I think the good news is the vast majority of Americans still believe in the longstanding traditional value, um, but we have a well-organized active group trying to shift yeah. where we are in this country towards differential treatment based on group membership. And I think, you know, part of the fight against anti-Semitism is the fight against this differential treatment. Because if there's differential treatment, Jews are going to end up on the wrong end of that all, almost all the time. Yeah, well, historically, um, every time. <laughs> right. And so, so we really... Right. And so, and this is another kind of key part, I think, of the fight against anti-Semitism is, um, is that we need to make the fight against anti-Semitism is not really a fight for Jews. It's really a fight for American values that protect all groups. And uh, we shouldn't want preferential treatment. We just want equal treatment. The same treatment as everyone else. And we so, so, and the more we make this a fight, not about Jews, but a fight about American values, the more allies we have. Right. And the stronger right. our case is because then we're making a case that benefits yeah everyone else too, and not just us. Yeah, no, that certainly makes sense. You know, if we follow the, the founding principles and kind of the value system that we've put in place, there would be no concern of whether or not anti-Semitism was running rampant and on the rise in the country, right? If that was something right. that was already instilled right. in our institutions. Um, so yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think I wondered you, and we've kind of talked a little bit about this earlier. It was just you mentioned the Marxist kind of outlook of the oppressed and the oppressor or oppressed versus the oppressor and then the privileged versus the un, the underprivileged, right? So because, and it's interesting because although, you know, Jews fall into the minority category and they have been historically very oppressed, um, they also, like you said, have benefited quite a bit in America from the system. Like they're like traditionally a very successful group of individuals in this country. So there's like kind of this weird disconnect, right? And I don't, I, I think the left just really doesn't know how to deal with that because to them it's like, well, this shouldn't make sense because the, the world is a dichotomy and it's only this or this, it's not both, you know? Well, I mean, actually, I don't think it's a, it's more of a problem for you trying to rationally um, uh, <laughs> Understand justify the left. it than them. They, they don't have to rationally justify right. it. It doesn't have to make sense, okay? Uh -huh. um, they can arbitrarily put groups into different uh, classifications um, based on political convenience. So mm -hmm. why, why would LGBTQ, I mean, which is also a, on average a relatively prosperous and successful group in America, you know, why are they? And I mean, it's just, these are mm -hmm. arbitrary classifications for the purpose of political convenience. When right. really what okay. we should be fighting for is not group classification and for equal treatment. Right. And Jews shouldn't be competing to be switched from the so-called privileged group into the right. oppressed group. We should just be in the American group with everyone else. Yeah. Um, and and I think we're all better off if that's what we do and just decide. Now that doesn't mean that our group identities are unimportant. They're important to us and and our affiliation with these groups and our voluntary associations are a big part of what makes them, you know, America. Uh, strong and and people feeling connected to each other and that's a very healthy thing um but politically the law should be treating everyone the same yeah um and i i think that this is an ideal that we've aspired to for a long time as a country that we have in fits and starts moved closer towards and i think we can continue to do that yeah no i i certainly think i i hope and I'm optimistic. So I, I kind of, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I've seen, I've seen enough. I feel like we're, you know, with, there are moments of serious pessimism where I see what's going on on college campuses. And I, I start to realize how, um, how little people have actually read the constitution and care about our founding principles. But then there are moments of hope when you do see, you know, students and student organizations standing up against these things. Um, and with, with, you know, scholars like yourself coming out with really helpful research to kind of support the arguments that we're trying to make here. So I think that there is optimism to be had. I, you know, I hope we're going down the right path. I'm curious, you know, for final thoughts on this, I'm curious what your, what your reasons for optimism are. Well, I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of them. Um, and just in general, if we don't have confidence, faith, 
in the American people and in our political system, then I'm not exactly sure what we're fighting for at all. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I believe that those are that the American people are basically decent, uh, despite all, we're flawed human beings, like like always. But 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 there is a decency there, um, and our institutions help us be decent, and we should be fighting for those institutions and our and and longstanding values that we've held um, to help us get closer to our ideals. And I I. I think the general arc of American history has been in that direction. Um, and I think that we can continue to move in that direction, even though things may at times feel very bleak. And I know that a lot of your listeners will, you know, feel dispirited at times, but, you know, keep faith that this is something worth fighting for and something where we ultimately we can make progress. Now, what you'll never have is total victory. You'll never feel like you won and it's over because the, the, the struggle is permanent, but there's progress. And I think we can, can make that progress together. And, and that's why it's worth studying these issues and talking about them and, and then, you know, ultimately communicating to our elected representatives and getting them to act in ways that we think help advance those ideals. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Jay, once again um, for joining us. It's great to have you on the show again. Um, everyone, this is Well Said, where I interview policy experts, commentators, academics, and students, and various activists as well on issues of higher education, free speech, and related topics of an American culture and society. So you can share this episode on Facebook or on YouTube. You can also find it on our website at speechfirst.org, Well Said, as well as our podcasts. Uh, you can find on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, pretty much any platform you listen to your podcasts on these days. You can download it. Give us a five-star rating if you like what you heard today. I'm Sharice Trump and Jay, that was well said. Thank you.